Now that we understand the structure of the cell, let's put that cell into a larger context and look at a little bit of physiology. Now we're not going to look at a lot of physiology in this class, but it sometimes helps to bring the parts together if we know a little bit about their function. You're also going to find that by understanding a little bit of basic function now, you're building a foundation for your physiology class. The understanding of cell function, I think, is best um, encouraged and helped along by thinking of the cell as a factory. <clears throat> the factory metaphor that I have listed in your yellow handout over to the right of the structural parts is a way of using some everyday situations to try and understand a little bit better what might be going on inside the functioning of a cell. So, um, the idea of a metaphor, an everyday situation to understand something complex is something that is used quite often. I know my kids, as they have taken biology classes at different levels of their um, educational experience, have been asked to do a project where they make a poster or a model or something that represents the cell in everyday terms. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, you could represent the cell as a city or as a community or as a house, um, any number of things. I believe the factory metaphor is really the best. And that's because every cell really is a factory. All organic molecules in existence come from living cells. Living cells are the only things complex enough that have a mechanism, have a number of activities that it can actually produce organic molecules. So everything in life, including the cell itself, comes from the factory processes of a cell. Um, all cells come from cells. All life comes from prior living things. When you think about all the life on this earth, if, if all life was erased, there would be no more life. Um, when people think about evolution and the changing of living things over long periods of time, we recognize that change is a part of biological life. The, the real tough part comes when you try to go back to where did the first living thing come from? Um, how could this complexity have come together um, in just sort of a, a chaotic um, chance sort of way? And uh, that is really the mystery. Um, because the cell is very, very complex. And how all that complexity could come together and then have a mechanism to reproduce itself um, is tough. That's, in, in terms of evolution, that is the big, big challenge to understanding the entire theory. So, all organic molecules, all living structures, everything involved in the process of life comes from life. You know, think, think about the cell and these functional parts that we've been looking at and studying. All of these parts are parts of a cellular factory. But where did all these parts come from? Where did the mitochondria come from? Where do the ribosomes come from? Walmart? No. Costco? I don't think so. No. Everything that you have been studying and looking at inside the images of these cells was produced and made by that cell. That cell 
um, has the information and the codes to instructionally build everything that you see. And so ultimately, the building of these structures winds up in producing the function. By creating that structure, all of these structural parts of the cell, the cell is creating for itself function. The parts that are there um, are produced in the right amounts for whatever the cell function is. So, so cells are factories. They produce organic materials that are parts of new cells and parts of all that they do. As we now look at the um, parts of the cell, we want to relate each part to a factory. And the little, um, the little list that you have on the right side of your yellow handout next to the cell organelles lists these parts that I'm going to go over. So let's look at them together. We'll start with the cell membrane. Cell membranes are the boundaries of the cell. They are what mark the dividing line between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. Everything that would enter or leave a cell must come through the membrane. In terms of our factory metaphor, that would make the cell membrane like the shipping and receiving department. In a factory that's producing some product, like um, let's say that we have a factory that's producing ballpoint pens. Um, in order to produce those ballpoint pens, raw materials need to come into the cell or into our factory. And so we order raw materials, we order some plastic so that we can make the barrels, and we order some ink so that we can put it into some cartridges. We order the little metal tips with the balls and some things are made in other places, but much of it we make right here in our factory, but we need some raw materials. Once we're finished producing these ballpoint pens and people are buying them from us, we package them up and ship them out. Everything that comes in and out of our factory, we want to come through one department that has people that are keeping track of what comes in and what goes out. And that's what the... Uh, cell membrane is like in the cell. Everything that comes in or goes out comes in or out through the cell membrane. The cell membrane literally controls the flow of materials that enter or leave the cell. So, in terms of our factory then, the cell membrane is what monitors and checks what comes in and what goes out. And you get to physiology. You're going to find that um, cell membranes are a big deal because they are dedicated to allowing certain things in but not other things. They're dedicated to getting things out. And the cell can't function without things coming into itself. And it really isn't of much use these certain cells aren't if they can't export or get products or things out of themselves. So there's a lot going on here in the cell membrane and having a basic understanding of it here is going to help you big time when you get to physiology. Okay, let's look at the next part. The next part is the nucleus, of course, and the nucleus is the administrative part of the cell. If this was our factory, uh, the nucleus would be the administrative office. Any factory is going to have big areas where they're constructing and building and putting together various products. But somewhere within that factory, there needs to be an administrative office. There's usually somebody in charge, um, a number of people that are doing various tasks that help the factory to run. So that's, that's what the nucleus is. All control of activities are there. Um, there are going to be blueprints there. Something in the factory breaks, you may need to go 
you know, look up some, some things on a blueprint, figure out um, where the problem is. Um, all of the production information, how to, put, how to make the barrels of these ballpoint pens, how to put them together. Um, if you were putting together something like an automobile, there would be a specific sequence that, that, that things should happen in in order to get that all put together properly. So there's going to be production instructions. Um, there are going to be um, other bits of information that all relate to the functioning and the working of, of the factory. And all of this is housed within the nucleus of a cell. So the nucleus of the cell has several parts to it as well. So each one of these parts has something to do with the administrative office. So for example, the nuclear envelope is the physical structure of the office. In terms of the cell, it's what, keeps, what separates the cell from the cytoplasm, or separates the nucleus from the cytoplasm. So um, if you look closely at the nuclear membrane, you'll actually see that it's double walled, but in places there are little openings. You'll see little gaps along that double walled membrane, um, which are like doorways so that things can enter and leave the nucleus. But still the nuclear envelope um, is like the wall structure um, the physical structure of the administrative office. The chromatin, on the other hand, is the blueprints and the instructions. Um, we know that chromatin is uh, uh, made up of a molecule called DNA. That DNA is uh, a chemical code. It's a giant macromolecule with certain chemicals built into it, regular intervals in a coded pattern. And so all the information for everything that happens within the cell happens there with DNA. Now how did this enormous macromolecule happen to come together without a living thing to put it together? That's, that's another question that's very difficult to answer. Uh, Enormous molecules with coded instructions like this. Um, it's very difficult to think how would those things come together. Um, so all of the information, blueprints, instructions, everything is coded into a chemical called DNA. And the third structure that we find in the nucleus, the nucleolus, is like the secretarial pool. Um, in a well-run factory, you're not going to take blueprints and, um, and papers and things that are your only copy. You're not going to take those out into the factory floor and get them messed up. Um, so essentially what typically happens is in a factory is you have a secretarial pool. You have a number of secretaries. Um, or data people that are going to copy down instructions and send those in memos or messages out to the workers on the factory to, to guide them and tell them and, and uh, help them do what they do. And that's the role of the nucleolus. As we um, are looking here at the functional parts of the cell, um, you're going to need to learn three, three-letter abbreviations, uh, one of which you already know. We've talked about DNA. It stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. At this point in your education, you don't necessarily have to know how to spell that, but you should know that that's the name of the molecule. The other molecule that is important here is RNA. And... RNA is another nucleic acid. It's like DNA, except that it's temporary, whereas DNA is sort of a permanent record of all instructions and blueprints within the cell. RNA is a temporary kind of code. And rather than send the DNA out into the cytoplasm, out into the workers, the nucleolus copies 
the coded information from the DNA into a chemical called RNA. And that RNA then um, can leave the nucleus, go out into the cytoplasmic floor, out into the, the working part of the cell, and be understood by the workers who then put together molecules and structures according to these, these RNA instructions. So the, the nucleus is the administrative office, but it has a molecule that allows it to communicate its information to the cytoplasm, and that is RNA. If, if we were gonna summarize this briefly, we'd say this information within the nucleus that's housed there is transferred out through RNA out into the cytoplasm where the cytoplasm then builds these structures. The structures that are built then result in the functioning of the cell. The cell does what it's built to do. Structure determines function. There's a complete set of codes in every cell and it's interesting though that every cell just builds um, the things that are necessary to its functioning. So that's one of those very interesting things to, the, to study about DNA. So we've got the informational side of this. Structure determines function and structure comes from DNA information. Okay, let's move on. Let's look at the factory itself. Now we're in the cytoplasm where all the action is. And action is dependent upon energy. There must be something in the cell that produces energy for all of these activities to, to work. And that um, organelle is the mitochondrion. Mito the mitochondrion are energy generators. Um, the picture that you see in front of you here is the generator uh, a generator that generates electricity in, in a dam. Um, if you dam up water high enough and you let it fall through some, some spaces in the dam, it can turn a turbine in a generator and produce electrical energy. Um, basically, a generator takes one kind of energy and turns it into another. Um, if you were going to go camping out in the desert, and you wanted to run something electrical, like a TV set or a radio. You would need electricity to do that. Uh, if you had some gasoline with you, gasoline is fuel. It's got energy stored in it, but it's not going to do anything for um, an appliance that needs electricity. You can pour the gasoline all over it, and it's not going to do anything. But if you have a generator, you can take that fuel and you can put it into the generator. It will cause the generator to work and the, the generator will produce electricity. If you didn't have any gasoline, you couldn't have any electricity. But essentially, if you get right down to it, the generator is changing an energy that is stored in a fuel like gasoline into another type of energy called electricity. And that's what you see happening here. Now, the mitochondrion does essentially the same thing like this. Right? The food that you eat is processed by your body and ultimately winds up, some of those food molecules wind up inside the cell. They essentially go to the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion takes those food molecules, breaks them down, releases the energy, and it produces an energy for the cell called ATP. Here's that third three-letter abbreviation I was telling you about. At this point, I don't think it's, it's important that you actually know what it is. You'll learn this in physiology. But at this point, you need to know that every activity in the cell runs on ATP. And essentially, the mitochondrion is that generator taking the food fuel and producing the ATP energy that runs the cell. So, that's the energy generator. Now, next, we have 
the endoplasmic reticulum. These are actually the assembly lines. This is where things within the cell get built. If you've ever seen a movie or a picture or a video of an assembly line, um, the typical one that you might see is one um, in a car or an auto manufacturing plant where the body of the car comes down a line, it's moved on a conveyor belt or whatever, and workers or robots step up and one at a time add some part to the car so that it slowly but surely becomes built into what it's going to be. Something like that is happening in the cell, molecule by molecule. Um, parts within the cell are built little by little by little. And they're built along these, these assembly lines, the rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And the ribosomes are the workers. The ribosomes are the physical structures that can read the RNA code that temporary messenger information sent from the nucleus. They can read that and take very, very simple molecules in the cytoplasm and build these big complex organic molecules that are needed. The rough endoplasmic reticulum are, of course, the assembly lines with the workers right on them. The ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum are literally building the products. Sometimes you see ribosomes just um, out loose in the cytoplasm. Uh, you, you should probably think of those ribosomes as being on a coffee break. They're not right on the assembly lines at that moment working. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum are also assembly lines, but assembly lines without workers. Typically, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum lead away from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So, whereas the rough endoplasmic reticulum builds all of these molecules, many of these molecules will self-assemble later on. And so as they pass through the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, various molecules that have an attraction or an affinity for one another will come together and produce bigger and more complex molecules. So, the, act, the action is right here on the endoplasmic reticulum with the ribosomes. Once products are built, they're either useful within the cell, maybe the ribosomes are building more mitochondria, or maybe they're building more ribosomes, or maybe they're building more RNA molecules, or whatever it is. But once things are built, sometimes the things that get built need to leave the cell. And the Golgi apparatus is actually the packaging department. Uh, many of these assembly lines ultimately lead to a Golgi. The products collect there. And if you remember the structure of the Golgi, it's got these thin little walls that have the product inside. And then they pinch off little bubbles from the end of these little walls. And those little bubbles then contain the product. And it's just like kind of putting, um, if we're going to ship some ballpoint pens, if we want them to go somewhere, we're going to put them into a cardboard box and seal that up, and that's going to get shipped out. Very much the same thing. So you want to think of the Golgi as the packaging department of the cell. Then we come to the vesicles. The vesicles are the storage chambers. Um, every factory is going to have to have some places, some rooms, closets, parts of its building where it's going to store either raw materials that are coming in or where they're going to store the product that they've just built before it gets shipped out. And so most cells have within them vesicles which are storing things for the good of the cell. If you were to look at the muscle cell, the vesicle there is storing energy for the working of the cell. If you look at a bat cell, there's a big vesicle there that houses the fat that the, uh, the cell is storing. Um, if you look at the vesicles in the white blood cell picture that we've studied, those are, um, there are two types of vesicles there. There are the ones that are taking in the bacteria, trapping them within the cytoplasm of the cell. 
and there are those vesicles that are the sort of post-digestive bacteria. After the digestive enzymes mix with them, you just have a vesicle full of organic molecules. So think of vesicles as the storage chamber and storage places within the cell. Finally, the lysosome. Lysosome is a tough one because uh, it doesn't fit the factory metaphor very, very well. Um, you know lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. And so like in the case of the white blood cell where, white, where the bacteria come in, they need to be processed. They need to be broken down. Maybe this would be like um, maybe a steel manufacturing plant that doesn't get iron, but gets iron ore, gets the rocks and the rubble <clears throat> from a hillside that has iron in it. And so they have to process it. They may have to add certain chemicals or heat it up a lot. And, and so that gets processed, and out of that then comes the raw material that they can use for production. Might be kind of what this would be like. Um, the lysosome is also thought of in, in many biological cir circles as sort of a self-destructive mechanism. We do see lysosomes in cells that don't have any, um, anything to digest. And so we kind of wonder what they're doing there. It may be that as cells age and get older, um, as cells themselves finally die, um, all of their organic debris could cause some problems if it wasn't broken down. It could be that when the cell dies, the lysosome breaks open, and those enzymes then begin to digest the remnants or the old physical structure of that cell. So we don't have a lot of cells hanging around. So um, sometimes they're called suicide sacs. Although I don't think it's sort of a... Um, may not be that sort of concept where the cell gets to a certain age and then opens its lysosomes to kill itself. Um, but it may be that, that when cells die, this is a mechanism to get rid of the rest of the cell. So lysosomes are tough. They don't fit this, um, this metaphor perfectly. But everything else we've talked about really, really does. And, you know, you want to go back and maybe put this all together. Uh, let's, let's kind of get the big picture one more time. Um, we know that the cell is a factory, that all living things, all organic molecules in existence come from the factories of cells. But all of those molecules are all built according to instructions, instructions that are found and information that is found in the nucleus of the cell. That information is in the form of DNA and that DNA does not leave the nucleus but the chemical codes, the information from that DNA is written into another chemical called RNA and that RNA then can leave the nucleus, go out into the factory floor and the workers, remember the ribosomes, are then the ones that can read that code and produce then the structure and the molecules of the cell. Either structures for the cell itself or in some cases products that need to be exported. Of course, all of this activity runs on energy. Energy must be available. And that energy, of course, is generated by the mitochondria in the form of ATP. That energy providing the ability to produce this structure then, of course, results in function. The cell does what it does because of how it's built. And it's built according to a blueprint found in the nucleus of the cell. So when you have this big picture, it's fairly easy to understand how the parts of the cell all work together then to form the function of the cell. So these are all concepts 
and structures and ideas that are going to serve you well and serve you in a foundation for both this class and in your physiology class. Okay? Good. Uh, let me know if you have questions.